Hi, I'm Jay Holbin, and welcome to FIB Online. What you're about to see is a small part of one of the lectures that I do for an organization called Hollywood Shorts. It's a six-part lecture series on the art and science of cinematography that's sponsored by Panavision. This is a segment from the very first in the series on the fundamentals of cinematography, and what I'll be discussing here is latitude, or dynamic range. For more on Hollywood Shorts, visit HollywoodShorts.com. Hope you enjoy, and don't forget to subscribe to FIB Online. Thanks for watching. Okay, which actually kind of leads us into uh, Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams, uh, I, I'm assuming that everybody knows who he is. He's a, a very famous landscape photographer. Uh, he was a brilliant black and white photographer. And Ansel created what was called the zone system. And it's really a method of understanding exposure and defining exposure. And what we're looking at in Ansel's system is a 11-step grayscale between white and black. And he identified a name for each one of these as a zone or a number. So we have zone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and zone 0. And what we have right in the middle here at zone 5 is our middle gray, our 18% reflectance. So what he's saying is this is just a way of defining 11 steps between black and white. And as it turns out, every one of these zones is exactly double the amount of light as the previous or half the amount of light. So every one of these zones is also an f-stop. So what he's saying is that, here we go, zone 5 could be a 5-6, that would make zone 4 a 4, or zone 8 an f-8. Because remember, every doubling or halving of light is the increase or decrease of a stop. So as we go down half the amount of light, we have changed a stop. This makes this a really great system for understanding latitude. Another word for latitude is dynamic range. And you guys hear this a lot. Manufacturers are talking about the dynamic range of their cameras. This is because what we're talking about is the camera's ability to represent values between pure black and pure white in gradations of gray. So we have our 11-step zone scale here, 11 stops between pure black and pure white. And if we assume that we have a camera that has a five-stop dynamic range. Now, in the early uh, days of digital, this was the dynamic range of most digital cameras, was five stops. That means within those five stops, the camera can represent gradations between black and white. But outside of those five stops, anything brighter just becomes pure white. There's no longer any gradations between it. And anything darker just becomes pure black. So if I only have a five-stop range, anything beyond that is now just pure black. I don't have these discernible steps anymore. And anything beyond that is just pure white. Let's say I'm shooting right now at a 5.6. That puts my medium gray at 5.6. That means I can represent these five stops between black and white before I go to pure black or pure white. If I adjust my iris on the camera, I'm now sliding my five-stop dynamic range to a new area. So if I go from a 5.6 to an 11, I've now slid my sensitivity. Now I'm going to see more into shadows or I'm going to see more into highlights. I am have the ability to adjust this dynamic range within the world by changing my exposure. This is a theoretical eight-stop dynamic range or a 250 to 1 range. It's two different ways of representing the same thing. This is a seven-stop dynamic range. This would be a six-stop dynamic range, and this would be a five-stop dynamic range. So we can see the more dynamic range we have, the more subtle gradations of tones we can define. Here with a very limited dynamic range, it's much, much more contrasty because we can't really see the, the subtleties of the shadows. So if we look at this particular image of Mason sitting in front of a window, and what we're looking at, the numbers inside this image are reflected light meter readings of those areas. So the light outside the window here reads at about a 22. And this deep shadow in here uh, next to her knee is a 0.7. So it's even darker than an F1. This is an F1 here. Her face is around a 5.6. And this particular image we exposed at about a 5.6 to get that skin tone right at the medium gray. But the dynamic range of this particular image is not enough to hold detail in both the shadow and the highlights when we're exposing there. So what do we do 
if I want to expose for the shadows. I'm going to open up my iris more to let more light in. So now I actually get to see detail in these shadow areas by adjusting my aperture from 5.6 to now a 2.8. I've opened up two stops. So I get to see this detail, but what happens to my highlights? These blow out even more. They go much, much more nuclear. Okay? And even on her hair, I've lost detail in her hair. I've started to lose detail in her skin, so I can get the detail in the shadows, but I'm losing it on the highlight end now because I only have this limited range I can slide around. Conversely, if we stop this now to a 22, so I'm going to stop down so that I see outside the window. I get the detail in those highlights. Now I've lost all of my shadow detail. I've even lost my midtones. Now she's just a silhouette. This is one of the first decisions that a cinematographer has to make. Where am I putting my dynamic range of my particular camera within the scene that we're shooting? And how do I manipulate that? So what's one of the problems that we're facing in this particular scenario? We can't have it all, can we? We can't have the highlights outside the window and the shadows inside. How do we do that? This is why we light. If we look at a, another example of an image here, the image of Monet here by the bright light coming out, coming through the doorway. So she's lit through natural light here coming through the door, but inside is very dark. And if we look at the, this was actually shot on film many years ago. If we look at the meter readings here, the highlight on her face here is about a 5.6, so we're going to say it's about 800 foot candles of light falling on her face there. And the shadow over in the corner here is an F1, so we've got about 12 and a half foot candles of light there. And the dynamic range is too large for us to represent on this film, so we have very dark shadows in here, and we can expose there. So what happens is I bring in light into the shadow. I am now artificially reducing the dynamic range within the scene, and when I do that, I bring in light in the shadows, I bring that shadow level up to the dynamic range in, within the camera, and now I can see within those shadows. Now this stays at a 5.6 here, but I have raised the illumination here now to a 2.8 and a third, so now it's within that dynamic range, now I can see detail in my shadows. So in order to reduce this dynamic range, to get it within the range that the camera can do, we artificially bring in light, we raise up that shadow level, and now I have detail, I brighten the door quite a bit, but I see detail on the shadow side of her face. So this is the fundamental reason of why we bring in lighting. This is the technical reason of why we bring in lighting. To artificially modify the dynamic range of a given scene to be within the dynamic range the way that we want it to be seen within our medium.